So avoid being hungry, fueling properly for the outdoors. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm somebody who has spent a lot of time working in the outdoors and I've spent most of my entire life eating food to some capacity. And I've gone through different relationships with it where I've thought food is fuel and I just need it to get through the day and get through the adventure or whatever it is uh, that I'm out trying to do. Uh, and I've also had the other side where I just want to eat beautiful, delicious meals that have uh, presentation and flavors. And I want to talk a little bit about all of that. Um, so yeah, the introductions to the topic uh, we're kind of going through currently. Our key learnings for today are going to be basic nutrition, uh, some food packing tips, do-it-yourself dehydration. I've got a couple of recipes in there, and then I'd love to spend about 15 minutes or whatever time we have uh, that you all can afford to answer some questions that you have. So I'll plan to talk for about 45 minutes, hopefully less, uh, and then leave plenty of time for you all and your questions. So why I wanted to do this topic in the first place is we all need to eat. And I know in my own house, uh, it's kind of a, a daily conversation, a daily struggle. We have meal plans. We have so many things to help us figure out what we want to eat, what meals to create, et cetera, et cetera. But it still is quite the task. So hopefully uh, by the end of this, we'll be able to make that a little bit easier for folks when we're packing our bags uh, for the outdoors or, you know, a lot of this is going to be applicable for our day to day as well is what I planned for. So what do I eat? Uh, according to Michael Pollan in his book, uh, In Defense of Food, he says, eat food, not too much and mostly plants. Uh, he unpacks what food is a little bit further in his book. And, uh, you know, to summarize that he, he refines it down to foods that your great, great grandparents would recognize. So when you flip over the, the food product in your hand and you see the ingredients on the back, should be things that you could find in your grocery store, um, on the shelves in the produce section, or easily identifiable, uh, and not using extra large language. Uh, in his book, he talks about how in our westernized diet, we often tend to uh, eat more food products rather than food. So, uh, you know, I'm guilty of it. I bring cliff bars and the quick to grab, easy to go snacks um, that have artificial flavorings and they are packed with the nutrients that we need, uh, but they're kind of food adjacent. So uh, it's a great book. I would recommend it. And um, yeah, some of my conversation today is based off of that. Again, eating is hard and we can be helpful with our food choices if we are informed on what we need. Uh, so that's why we're gonna dig into the basic nutrition of it a bit. Um, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not even a nutritionist. I'm just somebody who likes eating food and I've found some things that have been really helpful for me throughout my career, throughout my diet. Um, and I wanted to be able to share that with you all. I do encourage everybody to talk with a doctor or dietitian if you're thinking about making changes um, and yeah, make sure you're doing the things that are right for you, not just based off of what some guy on the internet has said, right? Before we go on any further, it feels important to me to acknowledge where I'm currently standing. Um, I'm grateful to be learning, living and playing on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Ayarhe Nakoda, comprised of the Good Stony, the Bear Spa, and the Chiniki, as well as the Nitsitapi, or the Blackfoot, uh, comprised of the Tanaha First Nations, Sutina, as well as the Metis District of Battle Region Territory. Uh, this area is also known as Treaty 7 Territory. Uh, I've been living here for about the last 10 years. It's a beautiful place to call home. Um, learning more about the indigenous languages around uh, the names of the features of this place that I call home, 
they use words to describe the rock faces, the rivers, and the way that the land and the mountains meet the prairies. It's been a great opportunity to, to learn from the land here. Uh, as I stuck into this webinar, it made me think about historical relationships with food, uh, relationships with food on the land that I don't have experience with. I'm not a hunter or gatherer. Um, I'm not even a hunter. Uh, so for me, it it's brought up a lot of a lot of different thoughts, emotions, and feelings, and uh, maybe it will for you as well. And I invite you to uh, to sink into those thoughts. So again. Here's a, a photo of me hanging out with a backpack full of food uh, somewhere in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, I've been working with Outward Bound for the last two and a half, three years uh, of a 14 plus year career working in outdoor leadership. Uh, loads of certifications there that I'm, I'm happy to talk to folks about outside of this program. If you wanna learn more about uh, navigating the outdoor industry, uh, that's what the training academy is all about, and I'd love to chat with you. So uh, please feel free to drop me an email or, uh, yeah, thanks. Food, we're getting into it now. So a uh, couple of quotes for us. Uh, the only thing better than a friend is a friend with chocolate. Um, for me, what that speaks to in this presentation is the importance of bringing things that are going to fill your belly as well as your heart. So being mindful of who and what you're bringing along on the trail. Uh, secondly, uh, to eat is a necessity, uh, but to eat, I've got all my screens in the wrong places, but to eat uh, tastefully, intelligently is an art. Um, again, speaking to that uh, is how I want us to look at nutrition and what we're putting in our bags and checking out the labels from time to time. Um, knowing what we're putting in our bodies is going to be great. Food is the ingredient that binds us together. Uh, a lot of outdoor adventures, some people might argue, are having picnics in really beautiful places. Um, I know that's the way that I feel about hiking, and I've had some really great food in some really great places with some really great people, and I'd love to share a couple of stories and photos about that. And one cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. Uh, I really like that one. Uh, what it makes me think of is all the years in grade school taking tests and standardized tests, and they're saying, eat a good breakfast uh, before tomorrow's test. As a kid, it didn't really land well. Uh, as an adult, I, I now can't make a, a solid decision if I've even got an ounce of hunger in me. So um, yeah, that one resonates with me quite well. Hopefully it does you too. Before you go, uh, this is kind of step one, if we're thinking about leave no trace, we're planning ahead. Um, but when we're applying it to food, some of the things I want us to think about are what activity or activities are you doing? Some of us are multi-sport enthusiasts and we are bicycling to our canoe to then go hiking and then go rock climbing. And we need to be thinking about all of those activities, how much food, calories, uh, what do we need uh, to make ourselves as successful as possible for all of those activities. And also thinking about how we're packing it. Uh, I've been learning through this, this process that, you know, packing for, uh, a, a hiking trip compared to a sea kayaking expedition, they're going to be different. Um, and yeah, considering that. How are you getting there? Again, your mode of transportation, are you packing it into a boat? Are you packing it into a barrel? Uh, or are you just going to put it on your back? Um, how long are you going? So knowing how much food to bring, all of that's going to be important. What do your days and nights look like? Are you planning on having time to sit down for meals? Are you looking uh, forward to the evenings and being able to sit down, cook, peel potatoes, and really take your time? Or 
are you feeling like things are going to be a little bit more on a, a tight schedule and you've got boil in the bag meals? How are you going to cook? Do you have a stove? Do you have a fire? How many are in your group? Are there any dietary restrictions or considerations? Because if you are a guide, if you are the lead, um, even just in your, your friend group, you want to make sure that everybody in your party is getting what they need. And it's worth a conversation, especially among friends. Uh, yeah. So how much time do you want to be cooking for? Do you have loads of time in the evenings? Are you planning on having time in the evenings? Is there a possibility that you're not going to have time to, to do all the meal preparations? So making a couple of meals that are gonna be a little bit easier. Um, what happens if you lose some food? So spoilage can happen. Uh, I've had tortillas get damp and then mold and then, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a no-go for me. You can pick around some of the mold, but we're also trying to do this in a professional setting sometimes, and we don't want to give our clients uh, moldy food and tell them to just pick around it, right? So what does that look like uh, if some food spoils or you lose it, you know, canoe barrels or things like that? Worst case scenario, right? Um, what style of meal will you be eating? So uh, are you doing individual meals where if you're working with just your friends, everybody's going to pack their own ingredients, pack their own food, uh, or are you doing group meals, family style, small group, all these considerations? And then what do you need to prepare your meals? All of those tools. Um, and again, I encourage you to, to think about this in the very early, early stages of whatever it is you're getting up to. So macronutrients, maybe um, this is why you came. You wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, kind of the big three, what's going to power our bodies, help us uh, feel good, feel strong, uh, and not too bonked out and tired at the end of our days, right? So macronutrients are our big three. Um, those are fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Um, take note of, of some of the, the numbers there. Uh, we're going to be using it for a short activity later on in the, the webinar here. So um, with fats, one gram per kilogram of body mass is, is recommended by dietitians, and um, that help, helps us feeling full. So one of the things I'll do if I'm having Oatmeal for breakfast is uh, I'll bring peanut butter along. It's got some good fats inside. Uh, I'll drop that big dollop in my, my oatmeal. That helps me feel full a little bit longer. It's got the protein. It's got the carbohydrates. Uh, similarly, I might just drop in uh, some coconut milk or coconut oil. Um, same idea. It's got those good fats that are going to help me uh, stay full and feel satiated throughout the day. Um, it's also going to help keep things moving, you know, as we're, we're working, moving our bodies, potentially going from hydrated to dehydrated. Um, we need something to help keep the, the motility inside our bodies, uh, working regularly. So that's a good thing. Uh, protein, everybody talks about protein and one to two grams per kilogram of body weight uh, is recommended. Um, a lot of us know and understand that it's building and rebuilding muscles. Uh, it provides essential amino acids and can be found uh, in plant or animal-based proteins. Uh, maybe you're familiar with protein powders, maybe you've had the Beyond Meat, uh, maybe you're a, a good old fashioned meat eater and steak and chicken and all of those things packed, packed with proteins. Uh, what we're looking for is getting as complete of proteins as possible. Uh, so, you know, when you're eating, uh, like red meat or white meat, that's got almost all of the, the complete proteins packed in there. If you're operating off of a vegetarian diet where maybe you're eating a lot of legumes, obviously vegetables, um, other beans and things, uh, you need to be thinking about how to combine uh, those proteins to create that complete amino acid chain so that you're getting 
uh, equivalent proteins that our mediating uh, folks are. All right. Uh, carbohydrates, we all know where to find them, and I feel like we probably spent a lot of time trying to avoid them. Let's not do that anymore. Uh, carbohydrates are going to be our friends. They are fuel for our day-to-day. -day. Uh, they digest rapidly, and so they're accessible rapidly to our bodies. Um, two to six grams of uh, carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight. Sorry if I didn't say this before, this is per day and this is recommended. Uh, again, speak to a doctor and, uh, and or a dietitian if you have access to that to um, figure out what's right for, for you, your body type, your activity levels. Uh, this is kind of a, a broad scale spectrum of, of what's out there and what's recommended. So um, yeah, just wanted to, to make sure I touched on that and reminded us of it, but two to six grams per day um, per kilogram of body weight is recommended. Uh, looking at the breakdown of what carbohydrates are, we've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Like that's that's a great, basic, simple, um, elemental combination that, you know, we've complicated by um, putting all sorts of things that we don't know how to pronounce and calling it a carb. And then often I think where carbs will get the bad name is we're not as active on a daily basis maybe as we are when we're hiking or leading a group or canoeing, paddling along the coasts or going out for a dog walk. Um, so carbs then get this bad rap because when we're sitting in front of our computers, they're burning up rapidly, they're turning into sugars in our body, but they're not able to go anywhere uh, as quickly as maybe they could or should. So uh, picking and choosing when uh, a carbohydrate snack or a uh, carb heavy meal um, is important. Um, yeah. And obviously micronutrients, those are equally important. Um, those are your vitamins and minerals from A to zinc. And if you're considering taking a supplement, uh, again, please talk to your doctor. They're going to be able to recommend what's best for you and uh, keep an eye out for um, things that might be um, counteractive. So everybody wants to know more about protein because that's what gives us you know, the the muscle repair, it's building our muscles, and nobody's ever been more concerned about your protein until you tell them you're a vegetarian, right? Um, and I can tell you for myself, I've been vegetarian for about 15 years. Uh, as you learned early in the presentation, that's about the entire time that I've been working uh, as an outdoor leader, and I've been uh, well-fed, um, felt nourished, felt good, and um, yeah, so I really like this image of this massive gorilla who eats uh, a herbivore diet, and here's this smaller animal. You sure you're getting enough protein? It's everywhere, and so getting creative um, as a vegetarian where I'm finding my protein has been one of the bigger challenges throughout um, my time uh, eating this way. Uh, but here, hopefully this list can help demystify some of the areas that, um, or yeah, areas that folks have questions around where to find protein, how much is there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of this is very packable on our outdoor adventures. So uh, beans, peas, chickpeas, and lentils, you can dry those if you're going for a longer trip. Uh, if you're just maybe going out for an overnight and you just want to pack the can or the dried uh, beans themselves to rehydrate uh, as you walk out, that's an option. Wouldn't really recommend bringing uh, seafood into the backcountry unless you've got some dry fish or uh, you know some very well sealed packaged. Um, same thing with your your meat and your poultries. Uh, eggs, 
I've had some really great dehydrated egg powder or egg crystal. Um, I've had scrambled eggs with it. I've put it in for baking. Um, and also if I've just been going on an overnight, I'll use a, a little container like this. You can put a couple of eggs in it and uh, crack them. Then you're ready to go for the next day. Uh, hard boiled eggs also pack out fairly well. Um, and then a bunch of other things here like our quinoa, amaranth, buckwheat. Uh, those are all grains. Um, quinoa, I love. Uh, I'll pick that over rice most days, um, but I know it's not for everybody. Amaranth, I'm not too familiar working with. Buckwheat, I, I love putting buckwheat groats in my overnight oats uh, as they kind of soak up the liquids overnight. Um, they soften and they're not as crunchy, but they offer like a really nice nutty flavor uh, to whatever they're included in and um, offer a decent amount of protein. Hemp hearts, um, you can put them on so many different things. Again, I'll use it for oatmeal, uh, overnight oats. I actually put some on my waffles this morning. Uh, I'll sprinkle it on top of a bagel. Uh, chia seeds, it's not just for those clay potters that grow hair and look like Bob Ross. Uh, sprinkles really nicely on, again, all of those things. Um, I've got a, a recipe that I'll share with you later that's packed with chia seeds. Um, they're just small, small plant-based seeds. Uh, if you leave them in water, they expand, they make a delicious pudding, and you can add a bunch of different ingredients to that. Um, and they're cheap, they're lightweight, and they don't really taste like anything. So that's also kind of nice. Uh, nuts and seeds we're pretty familiar with, but um, again, all great things that you can top onto, uh, and I say top, include on uh, other meals to kind of bolster those up, make them a little bit more um, full of protein for you. Up at the top, again, those, those loose recommendations of one to two grams of protein uh, per kilogram of body weight, and then a, a rough breakdown of how you can get an appropriate amount of protein for you per meal uh, with your snacks included there. Um, that really doesn't, that doesn't get us where we'd like to be probably that's only about 75 grams of protein uh for me that's a bit low uh i'm looking at the s there at the end of snacks and uh, i'm adding a few more to that and uh again like a small container of nuts like this uh this has about 15 grams of protein and um i think it's only about 91 grams uh i weighed it yesterday in preparation so um, yeah, you don't have to bring a lot to get a lot. Carbohydrates, again, we need to make friends with these. Um, they're, they're doing a lot for us. They are the, the main source of energy and fuel for our cells, our tissues, and our organs. Um, so making sure that we're getting them on a daily basis, thinking ahead, you know, uh, maybe you've Maybe you are an athlete, maybe you've heard of athletes uh, or food-minded people talking about carb loading. Um, that's kind of where this comes into play. Uh, the glucose is able to be stored in our bodies as glycogen. Uh, that glycogen is converted back to glucose and used later. Um, but if you're carb loading, your body is able to store a certain amount. Uh, I believe it's between two to 3,000 calories in um your your muscles and your liver to be accessed later um and and that's exactly what we need when we're out moving our bodies a bunch um uh, likely not just constantly snacking right we don't always have the opportunity if we've got paddles in our hand if we've got trekking poles or if we're we're organizing a group um so this glycogen is really going to come into play and making sure that we've gotten enough uh, before our big days, during our big days, and after our big days, uh, because that recovery process for our body is going to be incredibly important as well. Uh, 
again, here's a bunch of other things uh, to make sure that we're getting the macro and micronutrients uh, while we're, we're taking care of others in the outdoors uh, and taking care of ourselves. A lot of this, again, is things that we can sprinkle on. Um, it's lightweight and we can add it to meals. It's not a meal in itself, but you can also uh, combine these ingredients to make something. Uh, I mean, if you combine all of these ingredients, you might have something that's interesting, but uh, packed with everything you need to eat. Um, but uh, a story that this makes me think of in the photo is great. Uh, I was on a, a six week canoe trip with this group. We had done all of our own food preparations, uh, dehydrated six weeks worth of food, made our own menu plans. And I had one participant who uh, after about three weeks of eating oatmeal was just like, I, I can't do it anymore. Like this is beige and I'm tired of it. And I was like, okay, yeah. And I looked at their bowl and it was just oatmeal. There was no toppings, no fixings, um, no chocolate even. And so I said, okay, let me, let me make a deal with you. I'll prepare the oatmeal for you uh, for the next couple of mornings. And, and we'll see if, if things change. And, you know, uh, sure enough, after a couple of days of doing that, they loved oatmeal. Um, and they no longer felt like it was uh, a chore to eat, uh, looking at the variety that they could put on a daily basis uh, inside um, made a huge difference. And they noticed that throughout the days, um, their energy levels were much greater than they were the days when they were kind of struggling to get through their, their bowl of oatmeal. So, um, yeah, again, a lot of this, you know, oats we can make into a meal. We've talked a lot about it. I make my own granola often and just use a bunch of oats. Um, quinoa, I love quinoa salads and, and different meals um, associating that grain. Chia seeds we've talked a lot about. Walnuts are, you know, wonderful for your protein. They've got the omega-3 healthy fats that we're looking for. Um, which also are going to support you feeling full. Um, and um, it decreases inflammation. So looking for foods that are going to help out, uh, same with dark chocolate, uh, that are going to reduce inflammation. That could be huge for folks. Um, you're getting a nice tasty treat as well as uh, some muscle relief or you know, your joints aren't going to be hurting as much, hopefully at the end of the day and you didn't need to take some over-the-counter drug. Seaweeds and nori, I love seaweed snacks. Um, I love sushi as well. I've had some excellent sushi out on uh, backcountry trips. So, um, you know, there's so much that you can do. I would definitely encourage folks to not limit their, their scope of what can be cooked outside to, the dehydrated backpacking meals, um, or maybe what you've seen on like ultralight hiking websites. There's there's a lot of joy to be had in the food that we bring into the outdoors. And, um, you know, again, if we're just having picnics in beautiful places, let's bring really great food to enjoy in those really great places. So um, make sushi out there, bring dark chocolate, have a great time. Uh, this topic or, um, you know, hanger, this was, this was almost the, the sole purpose that I wanted to do this webinar. Uh, and I was talking to folks about it and they're like, I don't even know what hanger is. And I was like, no, 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 I think you do. And I think we've all experienced hanger. Um, and maybe you've been around folks that have been hangry. Maybe you've been somebody yourself that's been hangry, um, but there are ways to avoid it. So uh, ways to avoid spiking energy levels. That's what's happening when you're hangry. You uh, had a meal, your blood sugar's in a nice place, you're feeling great and satiated, and then you've been active and that blood sugar is burning off. And as you're coming into this dip, Maybe more questions are coming up. Maybe it's the harder part of your day and 
you don't have the energy. You've burned it all off. So um, this is something that I call hanger. I know I've worked with some other folks that uh, will also call it hanger. Um, but basically, it's just a fun way to talk about the, the dip in our, our blood sugar. Um, hanger is going to happen after your last meal and somewhere before your next meal. So snacking can be a great way to prevent those those deep dips. Um, you know, if you're if you've got a bag of trail mix or something that you can graze upon, that's going to give us two out of the three things that we're looking for, perhaps in a snack. So we've got protein, fiber, and some of those healthy fats. Um, if we can't get all three, two out of three is not bad. Uh, focusing on lower sugar index or starchy carbs that have a slower release. So thinking about an apple compared to uh, an apple pie even, right? Um, consistent timing of meals. When I'm working with groups or out with friends in the outdoors, uh, at the start of the day, I, I try and lay it out that we're going to have lunch at this time so that everybody knows. Uh, it's a lot easier to move throughout the day when you know when your next meal is coming. Um, I try and avoid saying we're going to get to this spot and then we're going to have lunch because that's going to be group dependent. That's going to be situational. And if I say we're having lunch at 1230, then folks can keep an eye on that time and they know there's a break coming up. So being consistent with your meal times, same thing if you're leading groups into the evening and you're in charge of uh, dinner time and you know perhaps uh, a dessert or snacks, just trying to keep all of those timings as uh, consistent as possible. It's going to be helpful for everybody. Uh, hydration. We're not talking a whole lot about hydration in, in this webinar. Uh, I feel like folks hear about it all the time. It is incredibly important uh, when we're preparing for our trips. We bring between uh, two to three liters per person worth of water purification. Uh, we also have stoves and other ways to purify water. So at minimum, we're accounting for two to three liters of water per day per person. Um, you know, what I've heard and been recommended is drink when you're thirsty. Don't drink any less than two liters of water um, and try and drink in, in big gulps. Uh, not so much that you're ingesting a bunch of air and you're going to cause yourself uh, some indigestion and discomfort. But instead of a, a small sip, thinking of, you know, filling your mouth and and then you're just going to drain your water bottle faster. That's basically what's going to come from it. Um, and then as we're active, we are sweating likely, uh, even if you are just speaking, if you're lecturing, if you're, um, yeah, not moving a whole lot, you're still releasing uh, some of that hydration from your body. And we want that back. We want to keep it in as well. So replenishing your body with electrolytes is going to be important. Uh, so, you know, we're all familiar with Gatorade and things like that. Powerade can help us. Uh, there's smaller uh, like noon tablets. They come in like a pack of 10 and just a little tube. They drop in 500 milliliters of water and they taste great. What I'll often do is have two liters of water going in a day. Uh, one will be pure water and then the other one will be with these noon tablets or some Gatorade powder uh, so that I can kind of go back and forth. Nice little variety. Um, and I'm getting my electrolytes. You can also get it from your snacks. Uh, so salty snacks are going to help uh, retain the water for you. So you're not just constantly sweating it out. Um, and then rest, we all need to sleep. So, you know, recommended seven to nine hours of sleep for a lot of us. And depending on if you're younger or older, that would adjust, but um, seven to nine, I think we're all striving for. Cool. So we've talked about the the macros, the micros, the um, the way to be conscious of how much food we're bringing, um, what's in it, all of that. Now I want to talk a little bit about menu planning. 
I think this can be a bit of an arduous task for folks when you're in charge of maybe an expedition, uh, even a meal could be challenging. So wanted to offer a few tips and tricks uh, to help folks out with that. Uh, this is a screenshot of one of the menus that we use here in the Rockies uh, for our hiking trips. Um, so, you know, every day we're doing a breakfast, lunch, a dinner, maybe not a dessert every night, but we're going to have a snack uh, of some kind. Um, and then we've got on a spreadsheet with drop down arrows, great ways to uh, organize ourselves. I've also done this where I've just used a piece of paper. I've done a grid thinking about how many meals, how many days um, uh, I need to pack for, and then just handwritten in all the food that I'm thinking of bringing. So that'd be like that top left. That would be the, the first step of my organization process. My, the meals that I need, the days that I need them for, and then thinking about what I want to eat there. Uh, in the Rockies uh, and other food systems, probably are doing the same thing. Um, we also have a um, fillable menu. Uh, as we click these drop down arrows, we've done the pre work and gone in, and we know that a breakfast burrito is going to include tortillas, instant whole egg powder, uh, refried beans, and, and everything else there. So We've done all the formulas and when we click breakfast burrito for day one, it populates elsewhere. Again, this can be super complicated uh, if you're just doing it for yourself for a single outing. Uh, if you're working for an outfitter or with an organization, uh, maybe they're already using this or maybe this is a system that you can bring because uh, it, it can be quite helpful. And there's an additional layer to this that we'll go into a little bit um, on the next slide. Um, but yeah, when you're building your menu, thinking about, um, again, like we said on one of the first slides, what are our activities that we're, we're doing to get there? What are our activities that we're doing once we're out there? How much food and fuel and time do we want? Do we have? Um, and also making time for meals is going to be important for us. So, um, you know, in an outward bound course, one of the things we'll do is night one, we'll have, we'll do it yourself pizza and we'll get everybody uh, learning how to make their dough, use the stoves in a way uh, that's not gonna burn the pizza. And uh, we've got some fresh ingredients that we're bringing out. And some of those fresh ingredients are gonna go with us for the next two to three days as well. So um, bringing those fresh things can be a great way uh, to get what you need, as well as um, you know, make sure that you're not just eating dry things and you're getting foods that you're more comfortable with from home perhaps. So the other layer of, of the menu that you can deep dive into is thinking of a per person, per pound, per day uh, way of packing. So at one stage or another, you're going to carry all of the things that you bring to the outdoors, right? You're either gonna carry it to the car, you're gonna carry it once you're outside, carry it on a portage, carry it from your cook site back to the boats, or it's living in your backpack and you're carrying it the entire time. Uh, so being conscious of how much food weight you're bringing uh, is going to be important. So one of the things that you can do is once you've figured out all the foods that you'd like to bring, you can go and look at how much each of those weigh. If you thought the other part of this was arduous, this one, is is quite complicated and so i'd encourage you if you are taking it to this level uh to simplify your meals and uh i'll talk about like making repeatable menu plans so that you're not looking at the the grams for a hundred different uh items that you're bringing you're maybe only looking at 50. but um we use this to um, to inform our cook groups. So as we're backpacking here in the Rockies, 
um, instead of having a large group of 10 or 12 having a meal together, we break it down into smaller groups of about three or four. Uh, this makes the food weight more manageable, uh, packing it and making sure that we have folks with dietary restrictions in groups together um, and so that everybody gets what they need. So in the Rockies, we're using about a, an eighth of a kilogram. Uh, so right around, uh, I believe that's one and three quarters of a pound um, per person. And other recommended uh, weights that I've found are about one and a half to two and a half pounds per person um, per day. And, and looking at that closely is important because it doesn't seem like a lot, like it is a pound difference that we're talking about, but that's a 60% weight difference. Um, and if I'm looking at that over enough days, um, that can really add up, right? So in a, in a 10 day trip, I'm fairly comfortable and used to bringing about 20 give or take pounds of food for me uh, in a single 10 day ration. Uh, if I'm going longer than that, we'll maybe have a food drop and uh, that makes things a little bit easier and lighter for us, obviously, uh, but logistically it can be a challenge. Um, so menu planning is going to ensure that we're making balanced food choices so that our caloric and nutritional needs are met. Um, it's going to allow us the opportunity to think about in depth how we want to pack our food. Are we doing it pantry style where we've got individual ingredients or do we have individual meals prepared? Um, are we doing group meals or am I doing my own food and you are doing your own food? Um, we can look at a per person, per day, per pound way of packing it. Uh, and then of course there's, there's storage. How are we bringing it? Um, and again, depending on your activity, you might have to repackage it uh, to make it fit better. Uh, when we're repackaging things, uh, thinking about spoilage again. So, you know, if at all possible, things that are in vacuum sealed packaging, I like to leave because they're going to do a much better job at sealing it than I am. I'm thinking about things like cheese, uh, tortillas seem to last forever if you, you leave them in, uh, in their packaging. Um, and then I'm also considering how can I be as leave no trace as possible um, and and not impacting the, the spaces that I'm traveling in or through um, or the wildlife big and small. So how are we how are we storing our food? Where is it going? What's it going in? It could go into a variety of things. Again, it might go into a backpack. It might go into a canoe barrel. Um, we have bear resistant food sacks that we use in the Rockies. Uh, those are made of Kevlar and we'll, you know, pack those. Uh, each participant will get about two of those bags. Um, and then, you know, I've got this guy with his green pepper in his hand and he's packing his kayak hull. Um, I don't know that world, but that looks far more complicated to me. Uh, and then, our voyagers who took hundreds of pounds of food, but it was a very, very basic diet, right? I've been reading about um, the, the, the biscuits, the dried meats uh, and the pemmican that they would eat and how plentiful uh, it was for them uh, for the nutrition that, that they needed, that they thought they needed in that time. Um, but there were also, um, a lot of of hardships in that time um, that I'm not saying a, a better balanced diet would have moved them through. I'm thinking though that uh, perhaps these these people might have been a little hangry as they were paddling their boats 50 strokes per minute uh, or more in some cases. So uh, lots of different ways to pack our food, lots of different ways to eat our food. So. Here's, here's my quick activity. Um, thinking about the, uh, the, ma the macronutrients that we talked about. So our fat, our carbohydrates, and our proteins. Um, I want us to look at this Hornby bar and figure out 
is it going to give us what we need? Um, a friend of mine proposed a question one time on a trip. Hey, you could go on whatever expedition you want, fully paid for. Um, the only catch is you have to eat this one thing uh, for the entire expedition. And I was like, you know what? I really don't think I could do it. I need a little bit of variety and that's just not going to cut it. But the challenge here is I want us to figure out if and how many Hornby bars uh, would get us to a 4,000 calorie goal. So that's a, that's a loose recommendation that I found for, for me and my body type, 4,000 calories. If I'm out working with a pack on my back, um hiking up and down through mountains paddling boats um i need more calories than maybe a recommended 2000 to 2500 calories so 4000 to keep me uh where i'm at and feeling good additionally i want us to consider the per per, per pound per person per day um so i believe these hornby bars are uh 80 grams per bar and if we are getting the required amount of calories, uh, are we also within um, our recommended weight of 1.5 to 2.5 per person? Uh, and again, think about that for how much food, how much weight can you yourself carry? Uh, that might be different for each of us. So uh, run those numbers, look at the, the nutritional facts on the left there see if it's going to give you the calories you need, see if it's gonna give you the fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Um, and this is kind of what the process would be if you were looking at an entire food menu uh, and the things to, uh, to give you a per person, per pound, per day. It's really a mouthful um, way of packing your food. I've just refined it down to one single item. So imagine doing this for your tortillas, your granolas, et cetera. So um, you can keep working on that and I'll give us the answers here. So at 360 calories each, I found 11 bars is gonna give me about what I need um, to meet that calorie goal. We're coming up a little bit short and then it's gonna give 198 grams of fat uh, 462 grams of carbohydrates and 121 grams of protein. So not bad, um, is kind of what I was, was coming up with. Um, on the left, I've got some pros. So it comes in at 128.5 calories per ounce. Um, that's a way that you can make sure that your foods that you're packing are calorie dense. Um, and that'll help you uh, achieve that per person per pound per day goal a little bit easier. So um, yeah, about 125 calories per ounce is recommended and, and we're just over that, that's great. Um, it's coming in pretty good for the carbohydrates that I would need um, and it's grandma approved. So what I mean by that is kind of a callback to Michael Pollan's book and looking at our ingredients list. If you read the fine print of our ingredients list there, um, you know, some of the ingredients are pulled apart a little bit more, but there's really only about six or seven ingredients. And I recognize all of them. Um, there's nothing in there that's monosodium, this, that, you know, all of these scientific words, things that I'm going to have a hard time finding in the grocery store. Um, I could potentially even put that together myself. So some of the things that I was seeing uh, as a, a negative, perhaps, for a purely Hornby bar diet uh, is that it's just exceeding the, the fats that a 72 kilogram person my size would need. Um, it's coming in mid range for the protein. It's not bad, but we could probably do better. Um, and then as I stated before, I'm probably gonna get tired of this food if I eat this for 11 times a day over however many days, I'm gonna get tired of it. Cool. Um, Quick tips from all of that, create a menu. 
And for longer trips, create a repeatable menu. So when you're going through the menu planning process, if you've got a good five day plan and you're going for 10, repeat it. If you're going for 15, repeat it twice. Um, I've done that for six week trips. I've done that for three week trips um, or even 10 day trips. So uh, another recommendation is eat your best food first. That way you're always eating your best food. That could be fresh food, or it could just be that thing that you packed in your bag that you're really, really, really excited for. Um, eat your best food first. And then even when you're just eating plain crackers at the end of your trip, the best food you got. Uh, I recommend packing a spice kit. So that can make a big difference. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Um, and garlic powder is probably the minimum that I'm packing. Pack other things if you like more flavors. Um, I've not been upset about bringing a, a spice kit with me. Um, try things close to home. So as you are figuring out what works and what doesn't work for you, don't do it in a high risk situation where this is the food that you have and you're in the middle of a, a big hike or big outing. Um, try it at home. Cook it on the, the camp stove just in your driveway or something like that. Um, when you're thinking about your menu, consider meals that are easy to eat, easy to pack, easy to cook, and easy to clean. Uh, that's just, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about time and how you want to spend it, um, yeah, having an easy cleanup and an easy cook up is, is something that I like. Um, don't change what you eat before or during trips. So uh, if you're thinking about changing up your diet before you go on a big uh, backpacking trip, um, give yourself plenty of time to ease into it, figure out what your body is responding to or not responding to. Um, you don't want to be in the middle of, of something and realize that uh, curry was not the right thing for you to eat on this trip. Uh, bring what you need to be leave no trace. We've kind of talked about that already. Uh, over longer trips, I like to bring an emergency meal. So in the event that it goes a day longer or we were stuck in one spot longer than we were anticipating, uh, I want to make sure that I've got enough food. Um, and that might just look like some soup or something that it's not even an emergency, but I'm just looking around at the group and myself and everybody's really, really hungry right now. So here's something else that we can add on to this meal, uh, help lift the, the mood and, and get people something warm and tasty. Um, bring treats whenever possible. So I don't know, three smiles with cupcakes in our hands, uh, you know, bring something that's going to make you smile, bring something that'll make your friends smile. And of course, don't forget your friends and clients with dietary needs. Food brings people together. Here we are, uh, cupcakes in high places, um, making, I don't even know what we are on the stove there. Uh, that was the best rib that I've ever enjoyed. And my my two participants enjoying uh you know, it was probably cheese and crackers uh, out of a bowl kind of mushed up together, but they're happy about it. As I mentioned before, um, I, I've done some longer trips. Those longer trips have required me to dehydrate my own food. Um, I spent probably as much time dehydrating my food as uh, I did on the trip with it. Um, but that's what happens when you do a trip for six weeks with 10 other people. So that's a pile of dehydrated fruit and veggies. Um, we had a wonderful food packing day and I think about 15 people packed all the food with us and it went over much faster than the dehydration process. Um, but dehydrating is easier than you think. Uh, it's going to add variety to your meals, a nice way to get the fiber, the veggies, uh, and things that uh, maybe you'd be typically missing when you're you're out. Um, or if you're looking at things in your cupboard and those fresh things are going off, you can pop it in the dehydrator, extend the shelf life of it, and have less food waste. Um, 
Dehydrators can run between a hundred and a thousand dollars, depending on what you're looking for. A thousand dollar one is going to get you like a mini fridge size with 20 trays. And a lot of us probably don't need that for our single or family use, but uh, those are the size that we use uh, with our bound and other companies that I've worked with. Um, comparatively, those pre-made dehydrated meals can cost between $10 and $25 each. Uh, so, you know, you still have to buy the food to dehydrate when you own a dehydrator, but um, it could end up being cheaper in the long run uh, to just buy the dehydrator yourself. Um, tips for that could be finding your adventure buddy and splitting the cost. Uh, if you're splitting a $100 dehydrator, um, that's not too bad. You can also find them on Marketplace and uh, thrift stores fairly often. Um, so keep your eyes peeled there. Good cheap alternative. Uh, and then just a few kind of timings and temperatures that you might consider for uh, your own dehydrating. Um, this is going to be dependent upon a lot of different things, like the temperature of the the building that the dehydrator is in, uh, the dehydrator itself, uh, what you are dehydrating. You know, if you put frozen things inside of a dehydrator, it's going to take a little bit longer because they're going to have to come to temperature first. Um, so these times are, are estimates, and look into your your specific uh, device couple of recipes for us. Um, so this comes from my friend Julia Lewing, uh, who's also provided a lot of the nutritional information in this webinar for us. Um, I practiced and made these the other day, and they turned out delicious. Um, they were super easy, quick to make. Uh, Julia recommends using a food processor, which probably would have been easier. All I had was a blender and everything turned out pretty okay for me. Um, I put them in the freezer and they, they store pretty well. Um, they're nice and compact. I feel good. I've taken them for a hike already. Not these ones, but I've taken some for a hike and they didn't fall apart on me. That was kind of my biggest concern. Um, so I'm looking at this and enjoying it as like maybe a cliff bar alternative. Um, and I halved the recipe, so everything to make it is all in the mixing cup there in the bottom right, um, and they're no bake, so that was nice and easy. I just needed to chill them, and even once I balled them, they were fine. Um, so yeah, nice, uh, nice cliff bar alternative for us there. And um, I altered the recipe slightly. I did some lime, uh, lime juice, and kind of zest of it. So they're kind of like a key lime uh, bliss ball. And I talked to Julie about it and she said, yeah, that's one of the best things about them. You can change up the recipe and uh, yeah, mix and match flavors, experiment with it. So that was fun. Uh, another recipe for us uh, comes from another fork in the trail. Um, it's a, a book of recipes focused on uh, vegetarian and vegan specifically. Um, but also, you know, hummus is a, a great filler um, for a lot of meals and dehydrates really, really easily. Uh, I've made a lot of hummus in my time. I've had food processors, I've had blenders, and I've had hand mashers. Um, doesn't really make a difference. It's, it's mushy chickpeas and it tastes good. Um, so uh, this recipe here, once you've made it, if you wanted to dehydrate it, you'd spread it out on your sheets five to seven hours. Uh, and then when you're rehydrating it, it's about a one, 1. 1.5 um, hummus to water ratio. So 1.5 to one. Um, and I'd always recommend with things like this, do less water because you can put more water in. Uh, you can't take water out once it's in there. And runny hummus, if you're trying to put it on crackers, might be a challenge. If you're interested in working with Julia, uh, she does uh, teleconsultations. Uh, her website's here, her Instagram as well. Um, so if you're looking for more information, want to work with somebody who's actually 
uh, well trained in this topic. Julia is who I've been speaking with and has been a great uh, resource for this and also a great friend. You might recognize her from the carbohydrates poster. We've done uh, a backpacking trip together and those were some excellent biscuits that I think she was really stoked to make. And that's it. That's it. I'm sorry. I've gone over time. Thank you all for sticking around with me. Um, if there's any questions, I would love to answer them. And I'll just one more time uh, scoot over to this screen so that if there's folks on the call that want to apply for our programs, uh, we've got the QR code here. Uh, just a quick plug for our Alberta programs. I'd be really excited to see some folks um, in our foundations or essentials programs here in the Rockies. Uh, we're looking for a few more participants. Spaces are open. Uh, we do have transportation available from Calgary um, if folks need assistance with that. Again, it's fully funded by the Canadian government, uh, and it's a great way to uh, meet some people, build your outdoor resume, gain some skills, um, and have some really great conversations with some pretty cool people. Um, so yeah, thank you all again for your time. And I do see a few questions popping up in the chat. So let's, uh, let's check those out. Um, all right. So a question that I see, um, what can you do when nuts are not an option um, with a follow-up of as a substitution for protein? So uh, different uh, protein powders are, are recommended. Um, there's TVP as well, a texturized vegetable protein I've used. Um, if we're looking to supplement um, something for nuts in like a, um, a recipe, I've used tahini or sunflower butter, if that's not a, an allergy, so that can work. Um, another question here is, what are my thoughts on creatine powder? I've not used it. I don't have any experience with it. Um, I know it's it helps with like energy and um, there's also some bulking that goes with it. Um, it requires more water intake from us. So making sure if we are uh, using creatine that we're getting the appropriate amount of hydration, but I don't have any experience with that. Um, yeah, uh, spreadsheet with the menu, pre-populated ingredients. This webinar will be recorded um, and we'll put it on our YouTube channel. And then additionally, there will be a resource made available uh, with like all the websites, a lot of the information that I got from Julia. And uh, yeah, this will be a resource for you. Um, next question, please repeat regarding the program in the Rockies. What is the name of this program? So. Uh, with the Training Academy, we've kind of got uh, two, two structures. We have our foundations and our essentials. So foundations for folks that are interested, uh, maybe haven't worked in the outdoors, but interested in like taking, taking the first step. And uh, we're beginning our first one in April. Uh, we still have spaces available. Uh, the other level of it is our essentials program. So that's a little bit longer. It's uh, a 10-day classroom kind of theory-based program that also has a 10-day backpacking here in the Rockies. Um, and that's been more designed for folks that have worked in the outdoors um, or are looking to yeah, uh, level up. Um, and yeah, so foundations, first level, essentials is the next level. And then we have different different ways that you can interact with those. Um, can't use TVP as pea protein is an issue. Okay. Um, I'll follow up. Uh, feel free to email me with this question. So brandon.bolts at outwardbound.ca. Um, 
what are some good stores online, et cetera, to order dehydrated ingredients other than bulk barn? Uh, yeah, no dried hummus. Um, yeah, good question. So in my experience, I have done a lot of my own dehydrating for, for all of those ingredients. Um, unfortunately, the, the one dehydrated food provider that I was using uh, went out of business, but, um, yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have a, a good, good tip on that one. Um, as we have done most of our own dehydrating, I would say also that like some things are easier to find, um, than you might think. Uh, so like I've had great success finding like coconut milk in grocery stores. I didn't expect to find that um dried fruits and things you might pay a little bit more to have them in the the individualized bags um but yeah sorry i can't help with that one i'll i'll look and i'll try and add it to my my resources um a question about certifications uh, best way to gain certifications aside from OB, what are some good certifications that give entry to job opportunities in the outdoors? Yeah, great question there. Um, so the training academy, yes, uh, does offer us some, some opportunity to bring folks into certifications. Um, Outdoor Council of Canada is kind of what we're largely offering in our foundations programs and that's offered outside of the training academy and outward bound so if there's different ways uh, that you'd want to interact with the outdoor council of canada um, i'd recommend that additionally um, getting your 40 or 80 hour um, wilderness first aid certifications that's a great way to you know just take that first step that's Kind of industry standard for folks and then looking at different specialties do you want to paddle do you want to hike do you want to climb uh there's lots uh so yeah feel free to drop me an email uh himalayan sea salt good substitute for gatorade products um i don't know that i can speak to that um i don't know quite the quantity that you would want to sprinkle into uh your beverage to make it beneficial compared to uh harmful uh you know too much salt is is going to counteract what we're we're trying to achieve there um great and yeah carly i don't know if you're still on the call here I can bring it back to dehydrated times. Perfect. Oh yeah, uh, dehydrated foods. We've got a, a comment in here from MHO Adventures. They're a company out of Ontario and I have had a dehydrated meal from them. It was a delicious mushroom risotto. I'm sure they do a bunch of other great stuff too. Um, <laughs> question here about the essentials program. Um, let's see. It is not for Alberta residents only, no. So uh, you can attend an Alberta program if you live in New Brunswick. You can attend an Alberta program if you live in BC. Um, we don't provide uh, funding for transportation. So you would have to provide your own like airfare or travel. Uh, we will provide transportation to pick you up from the Calgary airport is kind of our meeting location to bring anybody that needs that assistance uh, or wants that assistance to our uh, program location. Uh, the purpose of desserts, mainly morale. Yeah, there's, there's some morale there for sure. Um, for me, the purpose of desserts is I love chocolate. I love sweets. Um, if 
I'm doing a course with folks. I want there to be like a learning element and um, yeah, doing no bake cookies and things like that. If, uh, if you have time can be great. I've made brownies uh, and, you know, learning different cooking techniques over coals on a fire compared to a stove. Um, just an opportunity to, to program in the evenings. Um, and again, if I'm looking at getting 4,000 calories a day, uh, dessert's going to be a, a good opportunity to kind of get a nice little top on, um, and make sure that I've got a good amount of calories in my body before I go to sleep, um, going to sleep so that your body's burning and moving things around, um, is going to help you sleep warmer also. A uh, question about my email. Yeah. So again, it's my name, Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N dot bolts, B-O-L-T-Z at outwardbound.ca. And great. Yeah. Thanks, Bryant, about uh, some prepackaged salts as Gatorade replacements. Another one from Heather. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then the question is it better to go to sleep with a, a nice full tummy. I prefer to. Um, and then similarly, if I'm winter camping or camping when it's cold, I try and have a snack like as soon as I wake up so that I've I've got calories uh, burning and helping my body warm up sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bryant. <laughs> um, Yep, underscore bolts. That's right. I don't even know my own email. And on that note, um, thank you, folks. Yeah, it was fantastic to spend some time with you. Um, if anybody has a question that they don't want to drop into the chat, feel free to, to drop into the video real fast. Um, I'll leave a couple more minutes here. Hot chocolate. Yeah, I love hot chocolate. Some good calories. It's tasty. I might just use hot chocolate as dessert sometimes. Hot chocolate and candy would be good. Cool. Glad folks learned something today. I've learned lots through the process. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Just take it to the... The QR code one more time. All right.